Well, I'm Mark Deary, and this is uh, the third lecture on Israel. And the, what we'll be considering in this lecture is uh, Israel and the church, different aspects of the church's relationship to Israel. It's actually a huge topic. We, we can't do all of it. We'll be doing some of it. <laughs> uh, and before I really get into it, I'm going to do a bit of a Q&A as well. But first of all, before we get to that, I'd like to start by pointing out that, uh, and just reiterating what I've said already, that uh, Christianity, Christians have made a huge contribution to the founding of Israel. I think Israel would not have come into being without the support of Christians. And indeed, the very idea of an actual politically realized return of the Jews to Israel in, in our time was something that uh, perhaps came to Jews from Christians. Uh, Anita Shapira, an Israeli historian, said the idea of the Jews returning to their ancient homeland as the first step to world redemption seems to have originated among a specific group of evangelical English Protestants that flourished in England in the 1840s, and they passed this notion on to Jewish circles. Now, sometimes it is said that Christian support for Israel is based on a particular end time scenario. People are wanting this to come on, and so they see the founding of Israel as an acceleration of that process. And particularly people mention the dispensationalism, which is the premillennial eschatology of John Nelson Darby, which did influence a lot of American Christians. And so it's said that that's really the root of, of uh, Christian Zionism. I don't think that's a fair comment. Uh, support for the restoration of Israel it was wider than that amongst Protestants. Some of the key supporters of restoration the restoration of the Jews to the land uh, rejected, would have rejected dispensationalism. And um, in, in fact, this movement or this, this tendency of thought is by no means limited to one particular eschatological scheme. So it's not just about, you know, reestablish Israel, Jesus will return, the thousand year reign will come. That's that's not the case. That, that That's the kind of, you know, common denominator of all Christian scientists, not by any means. That's not my particular perspective. It's also important to note that not only were Christians instrumental in the founding of Israel, but also, and the movement that led up to that, but also their continued support uh, ha is, is of considerable benefit to Israel. So the strong support of the US Congress, uh, for example, I think is really coming out of the grassroots of, of American Christian support for the idea of restoration of Israel, their theological belief in the return. So that continues to be, Christians continue to support Israel, even indirectly, through the politicians that they elect. Now, as I was thinking about all that I've been sharing, I was very conscious that uh, many questions would arise for people. Because there's lots of interconnected bits and pieces, you know, in what I'm saying. And, and I was thinking about some of the questions that people might ask, and I thought I'd ask them of myself and answer them before we get deeper into this issue of the church. Um, one question is, if I do choose to be a friend of Israel, does this mean I must be committed to a particular model of the end times, such as dispensationalism? Well, as I've just said, no, it doesn't mean that. You could have a, a, you know all sorts of different views about the end times and still support is Israel. Um, Christians supported the return to Israel before dispensationalism was established. And I didn't come to my love of the Jews out of any kind of eschatological framework. My personal approach to eschatology is what I think I could call humble watchfulness, longing for the return of Jesus, looking for it, seeking it, encouraging the church to be ready for it and to be ready myself. And I, I believe this is consistent with what Jesus taught his disciples as well. And part of that watchfulness is being on the lookout for the signs as well. And I think as part of my watchfulness and readiness, uh, this involves also having an attitude of love to the Jews, yes, and to Israel, but I'm not committed to any particular um, specific uh, end times model. Now, do I believe that we're end nearing the end times and the second coming of Christ? Yes, I think we are getting closer. I mean, it's kind of obvious that we always have been getting closer as time passes. But there are some signs uh, that the end is nearer than it used to be. <laughs> um, and I want to mention those. These are signs that are important to me personally. One is that the gospel is being 
preach to the nations in a way that's never happened before. We just had an, an announcement this past week that the 700th complete translation of the Bible into another language uh, was completed, the 700th language, I mean, uh, and uh, that's an amazing milestone. The gospel is going out to the nations, and Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel will be preached to all the nations and then the end will come. So we're certainly more advanced down that than we were, much more advanced than we were 100 years ago, for example. Another thing also that I think is a sign of the end is the suffering of the people of God. Now, I think it's always been a sign of the end. Um, there was this doctrine at the time of Jesus called the Messianic Woes, which um, was the idea that the people of God would suffer greatly uh, as, the, as the Messiah came at the time that the Messiah came. And Revelation 12.12 12 says that Satan is rampaging around furiously because he knows his time is short. And one of the symptoms of Satan's fury, I think, is assaults on the people of God, hatred against what God loves. So I see uh, such events as the Armenian and Assyrian genocide in which millions died and the Holocaust in which millions of Jews died and the continued fury against uh, Christians uh, in, in lots of different ways, such as the persecution of Christians under communism uh, and the hatred of Christians that I, we saw in the case of ISIS, for example. All of these are, to me, um, signs of the, the end, uh, in a way, coming closer because um, Jesus did say, and, and the, the Bible does predict that before, um, before the end comes, there'll be incredible sufferings for the people of God as Satan tries to get the last bit of destruction and uh, punishment uh, against God's people while, because his time is short. <clears throat> then there's the fact of the return of the Jews, which is an incredible event, uh, remarkable in lots of different ways. And I think that has to be of significance in the light of God's promises of return. It has to be something that we can't ignore. It's a sign uh, of the end. But how to interpret it is another matter. I'm watchfully seeing it and wondering how to interpret it. There's also the messianic movement. This is the um, creation, the arising of a whole movement of Jews who believe in Jesus and are maintaining a, a Jewish identity. I'd like just to say a few things about this movement. There's a puzzle, a, a kind of an inherent contradiction or paradox in Paul's views about the Jews. Um, on the one hand, he says that there's no more Jew or Gentile in Christ, that the dividing wall's been taken down and we are all one. On the other hand, he speaks about God's continuing uh, faithfulness to the Jews, that the promises of God are not yet fully fulfilled, uh, and they will be. Um, and that all Israel shall be saved. So he has a, obviously a belief in the continuation of Israel uh, as a distinct entity and with, with importance for salvation history. But at the same time, he says the world's been taken down. Now, how do we understand that? And when you look down through history until recent times, very often when Jews became believers in Jesus, they basically effectively switched over to a Gentile identity and their heritage, their children were lost to Judaism. And um, I think that's, there's something kind of disturbing about that to me. Um, I accept that the, the, the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile has been removed in Christ, but that doesn't mean that the Jews shouldn't continue to have a, a distinct identity under God. And I think uh, Messianic Judaism is a possible resolution of Paul's puzzle, and I believe it, it has uh, you know, great significance in terms of salvation history. So this is the, the phenomenon of hundreds of followers of Jesus or Yeshua uh, with a Jewish identity. They, um, there are hundreds of thousands of such believers uh, in America, for example, in Australia, in across Europe, and also in Israel itself. They observe the Sabbath. They keep the biblical feasts rather than Christian festivals like Christmas. They observe the Jewish high holy days. They vary in the degree to which they are Torah observant or, you know, uh, observant of Judaism, particularly the Talmud. So there's there's some variation and, and difference there amongst amongst the Messianic Jews. But uh, I think this is a remarkable uh, thing that's arisen in in the last 150 or so years, and it is uh, a very great significance. And I think it advances our understanding of Paul's position. It gives us a a way of understanding how 
the, a distinct Jewish identity can be preserved by followers of Jesus without denying or being in conflict with the principle that we are all one in Christ. So that's a fourth sign for me um, of the return, the, the coming of Jesus being closer. Humble watchfulness. I, I, I can't put all the pieces together, but these, are, these have to be significant. Well, do you do Mark, do you believe that God's promise of the of the land to Israel still applies? Or you do believe that God's promise of the land to Israel still applies? Um, does that mean the Jews can just take the land whenever and however they want to? Now, um, I don't believe that's the case. Uh, even in the Bible, it's not the case. So, you know, when Joshua and Caleb and the others spied out the land, reconnoitred the land, and they came back and said, this is a good land, let's go into it. And the other 10 said, no, we, we can't, there's giants in the land. And then the people were unwilling to go into the land. And God said, well, you, you'll stay in the desert for 40 years and your descendants will go into the land. And then the people said, oh, no, we'll go after all. So they went and tried to take it and they, they failed because God was not in that. God was not in that. And then later when the Jews were being sent into exile, they were certainly in no position to take the land either. They were losing the land. And so I think it's important to understand that the land is God's promise to fulfill. And it's not a blank check to be cashed in at any time in any any way um, by Jews. So you really need to look for the hand of God in the restoration of the Jews to Israel. And, and I do see that. Um, uh, I think it's it's complex, really. Uh, but but yeah, I don't believe that it, this just means that anything the Jews do is right and that anything that Israel does is right. I don't believe that um, you, you really you really need God to restore the people. And I think I, I believe he has that actually has done that, actually. Um, and here's another question. If I support Israel and the Jews, if I live out a love for Israel or a love for the Jews, does that mean I must have a hardened heart towards Palestinian Arabs or Muslims? And my answer to that is no, absolutely not. God loves all these and for them Jesus died and we should speak up in truth and in love for all people. God loves the Jews specifically. He loves the church as well and he loves all of humanity. Jesus, I believe Jesus gave his life for everyone. And um, God so loved the world. He loves the whole world. So we can love the Palestinians, but not necessarily accept all the Arab claims for them. And let me give you an example of, of this, how, how truth and love need to be held, uh, held firmly together. Um, the, um, the, the Jordanian royal family have set up an institute a bit like a think tank or a religious institute called the Al Albayt Institute. And it produced a report, the Hashemite custodianship of Jerusalem's Islamic and Christian holy sites. And in this statement, they in this document, they say, Jerusalem was always an Arab city. And when the ancient Jews came, they attacked, killed and destroyed everyone and everything they could. And they said that even after they conquered the city of Jerusalem, the Jews were never able to expel all the original Arab inhabitants. And they also say the Palestinian Arabs of today are largely the direct descendants of the indigenous Canaanite Arabs who were there over 5,000 years ago. Now, this is quite extraordinary, and it is this, these sorts of perspectives are actually not truth-based. Um, it is true that there are no doubt genetic uh, there's a trace of genetic inheritance of the Canaanites in, in, in amongst the Palestinians today. But the fact is, nevertheless, that Arabs are not the descendants of the Canaanites, not the direct descendants. Linguists, interestingly, consider Hebrew to be a Canaanite language. So the Canaanites and the Hebrews were actually very closely related ethnically and culturally. But the Arabs were quite distinct, related as Semitic um, as a Semitic language, but a, a more distant branch of the family. They were also in a different place. The, the origin of the Arabs is, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Rift Valley, the Araba Valley, and also the, the region to the, to the east of that and down into southern Jordan. That seems to be the original homeland of the Arab speaking, of the Arab speaking people. Jerusalem was never an Arab city before Islam. Um, and also, uh, I believe this is the case that Palestinian identity was forged in the early 20th century 
and it was formed out of a melting pot of peoples, many of whom migrated to the area in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So the Palestinians are not the direct descendants of the uh, ancient inhabitants of the land. They are a people who've been formed out of a whole diverse range of different peoples who many of them came into, into the, the region um, uh, in, in, in modern times. Um, I also don't even believe that the Ishmaelites of the Bible were Arabs. I think they were most probably Canaanites or part of that um, same group with um, Moabites and Edomites and the and the Hebrews. I've written an article about that, but I won't go into that now. <laughs> um, well, if I support Israel, does that mean I have to adopt an uncritical attitude towards Israel and what it does? No, I don't think so. I think you, if you love someone, you have a critical attitude towards them. And as I've said before, Israel has both good and bad. It's um. It's good to challenge Israel when it does wrong and to hold Israel to account. I, I absolutely believe in that. Um, now, what I'd like to do now is to consider some reasons why Christians reject the legitimacy, why the church and parts of the church reject the legitimacy of Israel. I want to chase down some of the threads of um, that, that line of thinking. One reason for opposition to Israel is the continued influence of supersessionism, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. And if Israel has been replaced, it has no theological significance. The land of Israel is, is in a sense, um, has no theological standing. And so for Christians that have that view, they have no theological motivation to support Israel in any way. So they would reject Israel and they would see Israel through the grid of, um, of some other you know, some other grid altogether, not a theological grid at all. There's also uh, a tendency to downplay the Jewishness of Jesus and the Jewishness of the New Testament that's quite deeply embedded in Gentile Christianity. What do I mean by that? Well, the New Testament, being in Greek, um, establishes some barriers that separate it from the Old Testament. For example, the names. Um, the mother of Yeshua, the mother of Jesus. What was her name? Well, in Hebrew, it was Miriam. But in Greek, um, it's rendered as Mary, Maria, perhaps. And so that's really interesting that the the names of... When, when, when names in the New Testament are translated, for example, into English, they, they're not rendered in their Hebrew form. They're rendered often, not always, but often in um, a, a Hellenized form. So, you know, you end up with James instead of Jacob. You end up with um, Mary instead of Miriam. And what that does is it separates, it's a kind of a, um, it, 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 it indicates a, a distinction, a disjunction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, even the name of Jesus, you know, he's, we call him in English Jesus instead of Yeshua or, or Joshua, which is the Hebrew form probably the Hebrew form of his name. Also, the use of particular words uh, can be significant. Take, for example, charis, grace, in the Greek. Now, in the Hebrew, this translates a word that's normally translated in the Old Testament as favor. And so what happens is that um, the underlying Hebrew concept, hen, is translated as favor in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, charis, which is in the, in the Greek is the, is the reflection of that, is translated as grace. So you have this a distinction between favor in the Old Testament and grace in the New Testament, but actually they're one concept. They have this, they come from the same. They have the same term, really, in in the Greek in the Greek Bible, for example, and um, that separates the idea of the grace of God, which is understood individualistically in salvation by Gentile Christians, as opposed to the favor of God for the Jews, which is actually grace. And um, so that, that creates a kind of divorce, a worldview, a, a theological divorce between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the downplayingness of the, the downplaying, sorry, of the Jewishness of Jesus is reflected also in, um, in scholarship. And one of the most marked and interesting examples of this is parable scholarship, the parables of Jesus. There was this view that was um, dominant for a century or more that Jesus was very unrabbinical in some sense in his parables. He was greater than and different from those Jewish rabbis. So Ulicka was the great, a uh, German scholar, was the great kind of um, source of this. 
And he said the contradiction between Jesus' way of teaching and that of contemporary authors from Israel is huge. Jesus stands as the parabolist above the Jewish Haggadah. His originality, in contrast to them, is proven by his mastery. Imitators never achieve greatness, immortality. So you look at his saying that Jesus is this amazing, immortal, creative, um, you know, teller of parables. But the rabbis are inferior and secondary. And, and Jesus was different from the, from the rabbis. He was un-Jewish in some sense, you know. And uh, this is actually really mistaken. Yes, of course, there was uniqueness in Jesus' parables, but the language of the parables is incredibly Jewish. It's a rabbinical way of telling parables. And, and parable research in, amongst Western scholars was crippled by, for a century by this basically anti-Semitic idea that, that Jesus was somehow greater than his Jewish identity. And in a way that was um, not, not so much that he was the son of God, but that he, he was this kind of creative genius that was different from those those uncreative Jews, you know, and uh, that's that's an example. It's just made its way through through parable teaching. And people would say, oh, Jesus' parables are so unique. They're so different from the parables of the time. Instead of thinking, actually, to understand Jesus' parables, I need to understand the language of the parables of, of Jesus' time. Um, another factor that influences the position of churches on Israel is the demythologizing of the Bible anyway and the influence of, of theological liberalism. So if you, if you demythologize the Bible, if you don't believe the miracles are real, you know, the promises are not substantive, and, and so on, you, you end up, um, of course, you won't have a place for God's promises to Israel. You, you won't, uh, you know, if you demythologize everything, then the whole idea of Israel becomes just a kind of a myth um, that, is, uh, that, that points probably to the church. It, it sort of goes hand in hand uh, with this uh, this trend of, uh, of of supersessionism, it's also interesting that some of the most um, the, the churches that are the most critical of Israel tend to be very liberal and progressive. Sometimes my Jewish friends uh, have come to me and said, you know, oh, this church has said this, and I said, well, you know, that particular church is dying. You know, they 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 are they've walked away from belief in in the Bible and the authority of the Scripture. And you look at their demographics and, and you'll see who they really are. A good example of this is the U.S. Presbyterian Church, which is uh, on the more liberal and progressive end of Presbyterianism in the United States. And in, in 2014, they endorsed the um, BDS movement, the, the Boycott, Divest and Sanction Movement against Israel. And they made this statement, the occupation has proven to be at the root of evil acts committed against innocent people on both sides of the conflict. So what they're saying is that um, the wrong that Israel did is the source of all evil, like the Jews are to blame for the Palestinian jihad. That's basically what they're saying. Uh, and um, this particular group is, is progressive liberal in its theology, uh, and it is in um, dramatic freefall in terms of its attendances and, and, uh, and demographics. You know, this is really in contrast with, for example, many Pentecostal churches in the developing world who have a um, sometimes quite surprising love and passion for Israel. And over the years, I've met um, numbers of Christians from the developing world who have such a deep love for Israel. And it's come to them from the scriptures and from, I think, from the Holy Spirit. And it's in such contrast to Western progressive liberals and, and their attitudes to Israel. Now, um, another factor, I think, that influences the, the decline of um, love for the people of God is uh, any kind of lack of attention to eschatology. Now, I'm not arguing for a particular eschatological scenario, but I'm passionate about the return of Christ. And one of the problems of the more liberal branch of the church is uh, there is a, the eschatology becomes another myth to demythologize. It, it has no real substance. And if you've got no real belief in the return of Christ that actually makes any difference to your living as a Christian, then of course you won't be interested in, in God's plans for the Jews and his relationship with the Jews as well. So this ties, this ties in with this. Another factor um, is um, that I'd like to explore just briefly, I've already talked about it, is what could be called the Stockholm Syndrome. Um, this is the 
the problem for Christians living in a, in a growing environment of jihad in Europe, uh, where there have been some really very terrible incidents of violence done in the name of Islam. And the growth of Islamic anti-Semitism in Europe, I think, creates pressure upon Christians. And one of the potential responses to that pressure, the pressure to be afraid, uh, is, as I said before, to tend and befriend, to reach out to um, to uh, Islam and to adopt Islam's antipathies as a s sort of protective measure. Um, this very striking statement of fear comes from France, from Patrick Calvay, who's the head of the French General Directorate for Internal Security. Um, he commented after a, ser a series of quite uh, grotesque terrorist attacks in, in France, where is the spark going to come from that will light the powder, transforming France into an uncontrollable country where groups take up arms and hand out their own justice? Who sees a crumbling country where violence and vengeance alternates between two camps, where the spiral of attacks, of attacks does not stop? I mention this, I bring it forward just to point out that the fear is real and the fear for the future is real. And um, that one of the possible outcomes of this kind of fear is the Stockholm Syndrome, is to identify with the source of terror, in this case, radical Islam, and which includes its uh, antipathies to the, to the Jews. Um, so that's uh, another, I think, uh, spiritual and uh, psychological pressure on, on the church. Um, another factor is... Um, the Vimy syndrome, and I'd like to speak at some length about this. Um, the reality is that in the Middle East, there have been in the last 150 or so years, some appalling acts of violence against Christians. There was the genocide of the Armenians and the Assyrians, up to about 2 million were killed. There was a very significant pogrom against Christians in Damascus in 1860. There's been the decimation of Christians in Iraq uh, and uh, some parts of Syria but particularly in Iraq due to ISIS and also before that, the insurgency um, that, that was unleashed when Iraq was invaded. Uh, and um, these, this has created a, a, a context of insecurity uh, for Christians in the Middle East. And we see that conditions for Christians have actually been worsening in recent decades, not only the disaster in Iraq, which has really decimated Christianity there, but also... The situation for the Copts in Egypt has been getting worse in recent decades. And many, many Christians are fleeing uh, the Middle East. Uh, the, 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 popul the Christian population in the Middle East is in free fall. And uh, the reason is um, the influence of Islam and the, and, and the impact that it has on, on Muslims in their relationships with Christians. It's, uh, in history, the Christians and Jews that were conquered by Islam were considered to be subject to a pact of surrender, the Dhimma Pact, and they are called Dhimmis. And as part of this pact, there were a whole series of very debilitating and humiliating conditions that were opposed on non-Muslims. And these conditions were really designed to um, entrench the humiliation of, of non-Muslims, people that rejected Islam. I have written a book about this called The Third Choice, which explores the evidence for these claims that I'm making. And uh, in response to this, this, this oppression, really, this being treated as a second-class citizen, there is a tendency which the historian Bat Yeor has described uh, for Dhimmis living under Islam to want to become like Muslims. It's, she calls it the mimetic tendency, the desire to sort of merge, <laughs> to, to fit in and not be too visible. In fact, Islamic law required that non-Muslims should wear distinctive clothing so it would always be immediately apparent that they were not Muslims and could be treated as such. And so there was a tendency for Christians to emulate Muslims. And uh, you don't just see it under Islam, you see it in other contexts as well where there's one group that's being disadvantaged. And one of the results of this mimetic trend or tendency was the the Arabist movement. In the late 19th century, Christian Arabs in particular, or Christians in particular, developed the idea of a shared Arab identity that would unite Muslims and Christians in a, a kind of brotherhood. Now, this was essentially a protective measure. And at the same time, 
you have a rejection of Jews by Christians. The, the, the translation of the, that horrible document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion into Arabic, was first done by Middle Eastern Christians. And you'll see this pattern in uh, Christian dhimmis, people living under the thumb of Islam in the Middle East from time to time of saying particularly negative things about the Jews or about Israel because it's, it helps you, it, it, it's protective to, to find somebody else that Islam might victimize more than you and to focus on them. So if you look at the, the statement of Coptic popes over the decades about Israel from time to time, they are very critical of Israel. And that helps them, I believe, in, in protecting the situation of the Copts, which is tenuous and they experience a lot of persecution. And one way of dealing with that is to at least uh, give to the, your Islamic overlords your, your antipathy towards the Jews. And this influences, I think, Christian voices. Tragically, it influences them. Um, there's been a whole movement of uh, Palestinian liberation theologies. Uh, a number of Palestinian Christians have been writing and influenced by liberation theology from South America and from the West. And they include uh, Gary's Khuri, Naimatik, Amitri Raheb. And these, these writings share a number of attributes which are concerning, really. Uh, and they're important because these figures influence uh, the church in the West. This is part of the response of the church to Israel, and it needs to be understood. So some of the features of these Palestinian liberation theologies are an emphasis on Arab identity, a shared identity with Muslims. This is the mimetic tendency. Another is that um, Zionism is described and seen as the source of violence and chaos in the Middle East, including Muslim violence. So that was the U.S. Presbyterian Church took that view. And no doubt, I believe they would have been influenced by that, by um, the witness of the testimony of of Christians from the Middle East. Um, also characteristic of these theologies is the idea that a violent Islam is false, and if not false, at least to be downplayed and minimized. So for example, Father Labib Cobbt, who was uh, the representative of the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, the uh, Catholic Archbishop of Jerusalem, he said it's propaganda that wants to prove that there was any studied or willed persecution from our Muslim brothers and sisters of the Christians. We consider it as a mere propaganda against Islam, a cold war against our Muslim brothers, and only benefits the Zionists of Israel. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, this is in the context of millions of Christians that have been killed uh, uh, under the pressure of Islamic ideology and in the name of jihad in the Middle East in the last century and a half. In the context of that, he says that it's just Zionism to say that Islam is ever violent. And how distorted is that? It's so, it's very, very disturbing. Um, some other features of the Palestinian liberation uh, theologies. Uh, one is um, the, the idea that uh, Christian and Jewish experience of Islamic rule was harmonious and peaceful. There was this kind of utopian view of history. Uh, it's not, not truth-based. Um, in fact, the, the genocides of Christians are, are a reflection that this is not the case. Um, another is the view that the Jewish state is uniquely evil, aggressive, inhumane and imperialistic. But Islamic aggression, Islamic imperialism is denied, not criticized, not critiqued. It's a taboo subject. So it's incredibly skewed uh, and not, not non-truth based view of, of, uh, of Israel in contrast to the, the phenomenon of, of states doing things that might not be good in the world today. The, the Jews are kind of uniquely evil. Um, and Zionism is sometimes equated with Nazism, which is really a shocking thing. And um, the claim is that Jesus is some kind of Palestinian martyr. Um, I think Yasser Arafat had that view. <laughs> and uh, Christians have used the idea of the crucifixion as a kind of symbol of the of the disaster that afflicted the Palestinians. So the Jews are crucifying the Palestinians just as they crucified Jesus. This is the, the framework. There's also a tendency to a Neo-Marcionite heresy. This is the heresy that the, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, which Marcion in the first few centuries promoted. And you see that tendency as well, that the God of Israel is a cruel tribal God, not the universalistic God of the New Testament. 
Now, there is counter-Palestinian testimony. There's a different kind of testimony from Palestinian Christians, but it doesn't necessarily get heard always. One Palestinian Christian said, our leaders are liars. They tell the newspapers that everything is okay, but when Christians go to the market, they're afraid to wear, wear their crosses. Another said, we are afraid. They have knives and guns and can do whatever they want. They can kill you simply for speaking bad about them. And Justice Reed Viner, in a, in a paper that discusses this phenomenon of uh, the persecution of Christians under, under the Palestinian, under Islamic Palestinian rule and administration, he said, one Christian pastor compared the behavior of Christian dhimmis to that of battered wives and children who continue to defend and even identify with their tormentor, even as the abuse persists. So this is a really interesting and important comparison. It's often the case, and I've observed it a number of times, that when someone is being abused in a relationship, in a relationship that should be a loving relationship, um, they can identify with their abuser. So they will blame themselves for the abuse. They will defend and identify with the cause of their abuser, and children can do this as well. Uh, this is a, an example of the Stockholm Syndrome, if you like. So what, they're, what this is saying is that... Um, Christians can be damaged by the experience of generations of living under Islamic dominance, including the threat of death and violence and dispossession. And this fear can um, generate a, a partnering of, of, in the minds of these Christians with, with the cause of Islam. They, in a sense, support the jihad or deny it, you know, by saying, oh, it's all, all violence comes from Israel. So this is a, the Dhimmi syndrome is an important issue to take into account when you're engaging with Christians from the Middle East. And my experience is that people from the Palestinian environment, Christians actually vary enormously on this issue. Some will be really taken over by this perspective and others will have a more balanced and critical uh, perspective. They'll be able to speak out clearly and honestly about the challenges that um, Palestinians face from Muslims. Um, you know, I, I have encountered in the West uh, Palestinian Christian leaders who would come and say, oh, the reason why Christians are leaving, you know, the Palestine is because of the Jews. It's incredibly ironic because the flight of, of Christians from the Middle East is, is everywhere due to Islam and the influence of Islam. And, uh, and to attribute this to the Jews is an, just an incredible lie, really, and completely false. Um, you know, it's, Palestinian Christians aren't leaving the PLO administered areas or Hamas administered areas, for example, because of the Jews, they're leaving because it's not safe for them due to the influence of Islam. And it's they're leaving Iraq, they're leaving Egypt, they're leaving Lebanon as well. I, I once had a, uh, an encounter with the Bishop of Jerusalem. I was part of a social justice committee uh, for the Anglican Church in Melbourne. And the Bishop of Jerusalem, the Anglican Bishop, was visiting and he came and addressed us and he spoke at some length about how terrible it was living under Israeli oppression. For example, he went into some detail about how unpleasant it was for him personally to go through Israeli security procedures at airports and how he was not treated with respect or proper dignity. And I listened to this and at the end I said, look, um, I've heard and I understand that Christians in Palestinian areas are subject to uh, some bad treatment at times by their Muslim neighbors. Sometimes their property is expropriated. You, uh, there is violence sometimes. Um, it's hard for them to get justice. And you see the encroachment on Christian holy spaces in, in Bethlehem, for example, with a mosque being built you know, right next to the church there. Um, I said, why aren't you speaking about those things? And he, he looked at me and he, he, he didn't deny that that was the case. He said, yes, but what can we do about that? And I thought that was extraordinary. He knows that, that Christian, Palestinian Christians are experiencing oppression of different kinds from Muslims. Um, but he, he feels it's, there's no point in saying anything about it. So criticize the Jews instead. Why? Why? Well, it's safer. Safer to criticize the Jews. The Jews won't kill you if you criticize them. You know, it's it's actually shocking, really, when you think about it. And so, uh, you know, part of his calling as a, as, a, as a bishop was to travel around and speak to Anglicans all over the world and speak against Israel and speak about how badly treated Palestinian Christians were because of Israel, 
but to be completely silent about the taboo subject of the jihad against Christians. Well, you know, I said before that you can um, love Israel and also love Palestinians. And, you know, part of loving Palestinian Christians is speaking the truth. I've, I've had to help uh, people who've been trapped in cycles of abuse in pastoral ministry and it doesn't help them to perpetuate the lie that's cut the lies that have taken over their thinking because of the abuse. That's part of the prison that they're in. You know, it's, it's just not helpful. It's not loving to the Palestinian Christians just to accept uh, this sort of rhetoric, which comes out of really at the very deepest level, a sense of fear and insecurity and instability. And um, we need more discernment, really, as Christians, and the church needs discernment in order to make its way through these sorts of claims. And what you find when someone is driven uh, by fear is that their facts get twisted, their, their history, their view of the world is distorted to fit their reality. And um, paying attention to truth is so important in looking at these issues. Love and truth shouldn't be enemies, they should be friends. Jesus, it says in the scriptures, was full of grace and truth. And grace, the favor of God, is, a, is an expression of the love of God. Jesus said the truth will set you free. We need both. We need both in our lives. One of the ideological problems in the West is that we have exalted love or a perversion of love at the expense of truth. And one example that I've already mentioned in an earlier address was that it has been that in, in, in Europe, uh, anti-Semitism, Islamic anti-Semitism has been a serious problem, but it's been a taboo subject. And the reason why no one has wanted to talk about it is because of the presumption that Muslims are an oppressed minority and therefore they need compassion. They need lots of love, you know. And um, so therefore you don't tell the truth about their hatreds. And that is sacrificing truth in favor of what is a distortion of love. Um, I had a really interesting conversation once with a, a, a very capable Christian uh, thinker, uh, a, a theologian and a, and a pastor from, from, from the Middle East. He was an Arab. And I was talking with him about the history of the Dhimma, of uh, the oppression of Christians under Islam and of genocide. And um, as we talked it through, he looked at me and said, you know, if I believe what you're saying about Islam, I couldn't love Muslims. He was basically saying, I'm not going to accept what you're saying because I'm determined to love Muslims. And I was absolutely shocked by that because it's so wrong. You know, you can you can acknowledge the truth about someone and still love them. And that's it's so important. You know, that's what Jesus asks of us. Love and truth are not enemies. And we shouldn't let the surrounding culture that's trampling on truth in the name of some perversion of love um, that claims to be for equality and for the disadvantaged, but is actually uh, not true love at all. I think both love and truth need each other. You can't have genuine love without truth. You can't have real truth without love. They, they work together. One doesn't trump the other. Jesus calls us to show both forth in our lives. And I think uh, one of the great difficulties with this issue of the sta standing of Israel is that you're, you're kind of pushed uh, to change your truth to fit your love. And uh, that's a, a pressure that should be resisted at all costs. You need, we need to be truth tellers who love passionately. And that means loving the people on both sides. Um, I want to just make one, share one final reflection about, about the role of the church in the time that we're living in and the challenge that that brings. Um, it's very clear from the scripture that God is a God who judges the nations. He holds nations to account. And that's an uncomfortable truth. If you've just demythologized the Bible, then this will be the last thing on your mind. But I believe God does judge nations and he holds them to account by biblical standards. And one of those standards is how people treat the people of God. It's very important also to understand that God's plan runs in millennia and in centuries. He deals with nations in centuries, not in months, years or, or just election cycles. So his plans unfold at a rate that is sometimes slower than we would wish. You know, the, the cry of lament in the Psalms is, how long, O Lord, will this go on for? Well, a little while longer, sometimes God says. Remember also that the covenant with Abraham says that all nations will be blessed through Abraham 
And those that bless him will be blessed and those who curse him will be cursed. And there's really a dire warning in that uh, for countries and also churches as well and individuals who set themselves up in hatred and rejection against God's people. And this calls for great humility and I think and care in how we address the issues I've been speaking about in these three lectures. Let me give you an example. The World War, World War II and the Holocaust was a, rightfully a cause of great shame for Western civilization. Uh, it's been a, a cause of national shame for Germany and not just Germany, but other nations that participated in and collaborated and peoples that collaborated in, in the Holocaust. But a really important question is, uh, it's one thing to feel shame, but repentance is different and that is what's needed. You know, there's a tendency in Western cultures to shame, uh, self-rejection, guilt about colonialism. Um, let's tear down statues, you know, let's deny our history. Let's say that we're a lot of hateful racists. This is a tendency in Western culture. But shame is a prison. It doesn't set people free. And you, you cannot come to liberty just through shame. You come to liberty through repentance, a deep-seated um, uh, awareness of what was wrong and also a commitment to change. One of the most impressive spiritual movements that I've encountered uh, was the uh, Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary, which was founded in Darmstadt after the Second World War. And its vision was really to repent on behalf of Germany for the Holocaust. And there was, in, in, in setting up that movement, the sisters had this great sense of urgency that an, that a that deep repentance was called for. And so they devoted themselves to the repentance. But that's what we need the church to do. And that's what we need ourselves to be doing, not just with the issues to do with Israel, but with all sorts of issues, you know, all sorts of iniquity and, uh, and violence and hatred that is around us. We need to call ourselves and others to discernment and to repentance and to biblical truth. And, uh, you know, it, the hope I would have for the nations is that churches would, would take on that role. They would call their politicians and their nations to repentance, not just to kind of force guilt and self-rejection, but to go deeper and to call for freedom, call for the love of God to be revealed. I have a friend, um, he's an Iranian, and he grew up in Iran, and as part of their compulsory religious worship every week, there was a session that was held on Fridays at the mosque or in the public square. And the content of the session was a denunciation of Israel. So there'd be repeated declarations week after week of how evil Israel was. And my friend who was listening to this, he didn't trust the government. He'd come to the conclusion that the Iranian government was corrupt and cruel and not godly. He didn't believe their religion in his heart. And he was intrigued that they would hate the Jews so much that they would devote all this energy to cursing them and cursing Israel. And he said, if our government is so wrong and they hate Israel so much and they hate the Jews so much, there must be something really good about these people. And he began to develop a love for the Jews. He, he began to love the Jews in Iran and uh, to bless them in his heart. And when he left Iran and came to Australia as a refugee, he turned to Christ and became a very beautiful and passionate, gentle Christian. And he joined a messianic congregation because he wanted to love the Jews and he wanted to live out that love. I really believe that that movement in his heart was a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was being saved from hatred. And my prayer is that we would all be saved from anti-Semitism. We would be saved from a kind of thoughtless replacement theology. That we would be saved from the, the corrupting uh, frameworks of the of the worldview in which we live and the pressure of those lies that influence us in so many different ways. But to get there, we need to come back to the source, which is God himself, his heart, his character, his love for us, his love for all humanity, but also his love for Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their descendants forever, his love for Israel. And so I would invite you to enter into that love. And I invite you not to do it thoughtlessly, not to abandon truth. You need to keep a, a very firm hold on the truth. Uh, and not to do it as a way of choosing to love one instead of another. 
you know, we can love all people, I believe, and still have a particular love for Israel and for the Jews. And that's the invitation I'd like to issue to you through these lectures.